Um, yeah, and so so that's the difficult the difficulty of of looking at uh, how how does communication happen? What is the meaning um, when you're looking at well your words and your tone, even your grammar, all of that stuff conveyed something totally different than what you had actually meant. Um, and so we have to find what the meaning is uh, and even also understand what the author intended and how do we understand that as the reader. So we have the locution, we have the Bible, we have the words on the page. Uh, we need to determine the illocution, um, the communicative intent of the author. What did the author intend for us to understand? And we also need to determine the perlocution. Uh, author's desired action taken from the text. So if I was to yell fire, you know, if I was just to yell fire, uh, the, that's the locution, just the word, fire. Um, the illocution, we've got, uh, you know, we're going to be alarmed by the word. That is, well, even if just looking at the locution, if I if it's written fire with an exclamation mark and all in capital letters and babes and you know conveys some like importance or some like yelling essentially if it was just fire with no other grammar or punctuation you know how are we to understand somebody yelling that uh, you know there's a fire so what is the the author's or the uh, the intention of the speaker um, by those specific words. Well, as a speaker, as the one yelling fire, I'm hoping that you are going to be alarmed by the fact Maybe that I'm yelling pulling fire. Pulling the trigger. Yeah. <laughs> pulling the trigger fire. <laughs> yeah. There, we could also take it in that way, too. Are we shooting something, or is there actual flames? So, yeah. Are you going to be alarmed by the fact that there is is a fire being uh, being called out? Um, and then further, I want you know there's an action that I also would like you to take, not just understand or be alarmed, but there's an action that also has to be taken, which means to get out quickly, calmly, and safely. So. So that's kind of an understanding of the illocution, or the locution, illocution, and perlocution. So does a text have one meaning or several meanings? This is kind of our question. What do we think? Maybe before we dive into it, is there any, any initial thoughts? Mr. Harpender? I guess it can it'll have multiple meanings, but on a logical aspect, it's only one meaning, right? Meaning under um, like when we looked at, for example, Timothy, we know that Paul's talking to Timothy, right? It, it's just literal meanings, uh, but I think it's how we kind of um, talked about last week, how we interpret. Never pronounce the word. So interpret. Yes, uh, the scripture, <laughs> um, depending on the stage of life that we're in or whatnot, right? Hmm. Um, so it's yes and no to both. In a way. Interesting. Whenever David says interesting, you know it's the wrong answer. So <laughs> that's how the chance to win here. <laughs> I think what is, what is interesting about the Bible is there's a multitude of people. Each one has a different level of learning. Each one has a different level of understanding. And yet the Bible relates to all of them. Yeah. You know, and uh, so we can read a, a scripture here that might mean something to me. And it'll be totally opposite to you, and different to you, and different to you. Yeah. And it, uh, that's what I love about the Bible, because no matter where we are, our level of understanding is there. Right. I think that gets maybe more into the, 
the mechanics of what we're going to be looking at today of understanding, you know, you talked about how the Bible is universal in the way that we can all understand it in a way. And so I think what we're looking at and our goal is today is to understand that that universalness is one meaning is that the text yeah, will have yeah, yeah. will have one meaning that is has many applications where you know where you're saying it might mean something to somebody else where maybe meaning isn't the word to use for it has significance or application to, for to different people um, but it has one meaning which is what makes it understandable for for all of us and so that's kind of what we're looking at is understanding maybe you know separating or being mindful of the language we use when we're talking about meaning and we're talking about application and maybe the difference between the two of those so but with that being said uh, there also still is the question is does it have one meaning or several meanings um, and so we're going to be looking at a couple or a few different options here and there's option is meaning is limited solely to what the author intended uh, or the second option is that readers, you know, can make the text mean whatever they wish. Um, so what is meant by the meaning? Um, is it tied to the intention of the author? Is it language based, um, based on the words, grammar, genre, etc.? Even as we had talked about, um, yeah, is the that uh, locution, uh, does that give us the meaning? Um, does it describe what a reader sees in or brings to the text as we're talking about in the reader response and even just our worldview? Um, so I don't know if you want to turn to Matthew 2.15 or Hosea 11.1. 1. Or maybe if you turn to, everybody turn to Matthew 2.15 and I'll read Hosea. So, I will read Hosea 11.1, 1, and then, uh, Josue, would you mind reading Matthew 1? So, Hosea 11.1, 1, uh, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Egypt, I called my son. Um, so yeah, so did, did Hosea uh, mean that uh, the son, or out of Egypt, I called my son, uh, would be uh, referring to as Jesus? Or was Hosea referring to Israel as uh, as the son? Even though he said in the first part of it, you know, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Uh, and out of Egypt, I called my son, you know, referring to the Exodus. Or is that what Hosea was referring to? Because that would be the assumption or the intention that Hosea is assuming uh, and talking about Israel. Because Hosea doesn't know who Jesus is um, and it's probably not intending to create like a messianic prophecy um, and he's intending to talk about Israel but yet Matthew uh, reads in or sees maybe a different understanding uh, of Hosea in the way that he says out of Egypt I called my son and we see you know Jesus and Mary and Joseph spent a time of essentially in exile, you know, uh, hiding from Herod until Jesus was ready, and then they came back uh, to Israel after Herod had died. So these are some of the questions. Is it Israel the son or Jesus the son? Um, so we're going to be looking at options of potential meanings. Um, so we've got five, five options here. 
uh, kind of out of those two ideas that we started with, break down into like five different subcategories, kind of. Um, so the first one is that there's only one meaning that is intended by the author. Um, so we can also look uh, at Hebrews 1, 8 to 9, if you want to turn there. Harvey, would you mind looking up, sorry, would you mind looking up Psalm 45? Yeah. I got Hebrews. Yeah? Do you want to read that for us? Verses 8 and 9. But under the sun he hath thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The sepulcher of the righteous, righteousness is the sepulcher of of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Thank you. Um. Want to make sure we've got the right um, uh, 45, 6 and 7. Do you want to read? Yeah. 8, 6 and 7? 45, 6 and 7. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. That's what Harvey's going to read. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. Its scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. S uh, 7 as well, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Yeah. So Hebrews quotes the exact same um, section of that, those two verses. But the writer of Hebrews starts with, but about the Son, he says, speaking of Jesus. Um, if we're looking at one meaning... Again, you know, did the Old Testament author of the psalm have the Messiah in view? You know, was that was that who he was who he was thinking about? Um, and if not, you know, you know, what is that a second meaning? Um, the problem with, uh, I guess, you know, we're the ideas that we're looking at. There's only one one meaning that the is intended by the author um it is the best option you know the sole object of exegesis is to find uh the the meaning that is intended by the author um, but the problem is is when we're even looking at things like hebrews or we're looking at the hosea and matthew ideas or we're, um you know exploring that is that it can be very difficult uh, as we'll find out, you know, to replicate things where we're finding, um, you know, passages in the Old Testament or just finding <clears throat> passages with multiple meanings. There are passages that have multiple meanings, as we will find out. Um, but I think the idea is that uh, the author, each author only intends one, one meaning. Um, and if there is a second meaning, as we'll find out, uh, you know, we have to be very careful that, you know, we can't just apply it to every situation or uh, that they're like a case by case basis only seen when we can actually prove that exegetically or when the evidence or clues are within the text itself. Um, like in Hebrews where it's quoting something else, uh, you know, from the Old Testament that they're seeing as being messianic. Well, the one that, like Psalms, for example, you love righteousness and hate wickedness, therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions. 
by anointing you with the oil of joy. How is that? Oh, that's but wouldn't that be, couldn't that be two meanings then? How do you mean? Like one meaning that he could be talking, the author could be talking about Jesus, or the other meaning that the author is talking about us. About us? How you love righteousness and hate the wickedness. Therefore, God, your, your God, has set you above your companions. That's a good question. Um, as we are... Sorry, I thought I challenged you a bit. <laughs> uh, in the con the rest of the context of of that, you know, I guess that's the when question of who who are we talking about? The which you is you or who who is the you when it's talking? Your throne, O God, speaking to God, will last forever. A scepter of justice will be a scepter of your kingdom. It says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, uh, your God has set you above I think that's what throws me off God's God. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, maybe just like a... Uh, could say like a different like just a phrase or um a figure of speech in a way or like just the way that they would be singing like god your god um you know i i can't exactly speak no. to that specific section but it is speaking like the psalmist is is singing to god or talking to god not specifically talking to us right. and so that's that's something where you have to look um, when you're reading is really try to sort out uh, who is the you that it's talking to. Is it talking to God, talking about God, or is it talking to, yeah, who is who is being actually spoken to? Um, and so we have to be careful, essentially, as we'll find out later, you know, not to jump too quickly to uh, to those ideas, um, but we do have to make sure we do the work quickly or not quickly but just do it um so uh second option uh, the author intended to have multiple meanings um so the upcoming birth in isaiah uh you know we can look at uh 714 so if you want to turn to isaiah it's probably a good one to look at quick Seven fourteen. Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and ye shall call his name Emmanuel. So there is a specific uh, intention that there is going to be something in the future that this is going to fulfill a prophecy. Um, say in more immediately things can be are fulfilled uh, in Isaiah 8 1 to 10 um, I can just read this for us here so the Lord said to me take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen Maher Shalal Hashbaz so I called in Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of uh, Jeberekiah as reliable witnesses for me then I made love to the prophetess and she conceived and gave birth to a son and the name, and the Lord said to me, name him Maher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the boy knows how to say, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. Um, no, continue. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Sh uh, of Shiloh and rejoices over Razin and the son of Remaliah. Therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty flood waters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, and sweep on into Judah, swirling over it, passing through it, and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings 
will cover the breadth of your land, Emmanuel. And so there's, you know, essentially a more immediate, uh, you know, understanding of there's a child born and called Emmanuel, essentially. Um, but then there's also the understanding that, you know, there is this child that will be born of a virgin later on, as we find in Matthew one twenty three. Um, that, yeah, we have Jesus. And so, you know, here we do find a part where you know, there is two potential meanings uh, that can be seen. Um, but the thing is that we cannot prove that the original text contained additional meaning. You know, when we're looking at, um, you know, if we're looking at all texts, you know, if, if this text can contain additional meaning, well, do other texts, or can we say that generally about every, t does every text contain another meaning? Or if not, uh, you know, do we look at, how do we determine if there is, uh, yeah, more that, that can. Um, and so what about applications even? Um, as we said, you know, one meaning, many applications, uh, and we have to be careful not to confuse significance. Um, or applications with meaning and so um, this whole uh, you know <coughs> that the author intended to have uh, the you know multiple meanings can be a very difficult one to defend I think just because there's not always evidence that shows that there's a uh, text can have multiple meanings I think in certain cases it's like we've seen there can be um, but Generally speaking, there isn't evidence that shows that a text has multiple meanings. Uh, and so we have to be careful not to create that as a method, I guess. Number three, uh, a later reader could invent a meaning not intended by the author. Um, so this is, I guess, the idea of like reader response. And we, I think we need to reject even some of this idea. Um, is the danger of DMM that's the, the discipleship making movement or method. Uh, this is what we kind of follow with the, um, the discovery group model or idea. Uh, it has its benefits. Um, I think this is this is the balance or the the challenge that we we face. Uh, you know it is a very successful, very easy to follow method, especially for new Christians, um, to get them into reading the scripture and to studying it together. Um, but you're also, you know, pushing, you know, essentially you can create groups of inexperienced Christians that are reading scripture. Uh, the question is, you know, what is, how, you know, how do you feel that you're understanding this passage or how, you know, what is the, the meaning that you're taking from this? Uh, and, you know, as the challenge I think that we've faced in Bible studies all of our lives uh, or, you know, for, for quite a while is you can have somebody that says, well, you know, I just feel like out of this passage or, you know, it could be just a specific verse and, well, this just speaks to me in this way and it might have nothing to do with the actual passage entirely. But, you know, it might trigger something else, which, like, it could trigger something else, and it, you know, could maybe make you think of a different way in your life that maybe you need to work on or your faith. But um, we have to be careful not to associate, you know, we can't just make our own meaning when it comes to reading Scripture. Uh, and so we have to, you know, it's the understanding the meaning, and then how does that meaning apply in a different way or you know that many uh, many applications it could have a different application um, but we have to be careful that yeah we're not just reading a meaning into it and I think that's essentially part of why I decided to do this course was just to give us a little bit of training a little bit of thought so that yeah we're not just throwing out the idea of well you know, the questions are simple with the discipleship-making movement of, well, I feel like 
this is how it's going to apply to me this week, you know, with reading this little passage. And so, you know, what are we doing? We're looking at the whole context of the passage. We're looking at, uh, you know, the specific pieces, you know, who the author is. And then we're also looking at who we are, what, what are we bringing to the text, and how do we need to separate that and understand what the author is trying to say. So that's the the reader response and so our the historical meaning of the text must play the controlling role especially when we're in bible study so we need to be looking at what is the historical intention and the meaning uh, four new testament authors uh, discovered meanings intended by the holy spirit uh, though not by the human old testament authors as uh, this idea of a deeper meaning or this a census plenure is what it, they call it. Um, so we've already discussed, you know, Matthew and Hosea and how he took this understanding of Hosea of Jesus being the son that Hosea is speaking of coming out of Egypt. Um, and, and so he took this idea that, you know, this was embedded by the Holy Spirit um, as, as a, like a fuller meaning or a, a second meaning. And so does all scripture have a fuller meaning? You know, we've discussed this a little bit. If, if some do not, um, you know, how can we tell which ones do? Uh, and these can be hard to replicate just through exegetical methods, um, unless, as we've said, the clues are being given to us from the text. Um, Otherwise, you know, we're falling into that idea of allegory again of, well, I can look at this and I can attribute a spiritual meaning or I can attribute, you know, a Christological meaning of some kind onto something that has, you know, nothing to do with it. It could just be talking about a donkey. Like, um, so we got to be careful with that. Uh, so that can be hard to replicate even that idea of the census planner. Uh, five, a New Testament author uh, sees meaning not intended by the Old Testament author, but which conforms to the patterns of God's work and is consistent with the historical sense. Um, so similar to the census planner idea, um, but you know we're seeing that historical sense, we're seeing the context even brought in, uh, written by the New Testament author. Um, so we're seeing these like typologies uh, be seen, and you know, it's it's the stuff written in the New Testament that is looking back at the Old Testament and finding ways where, you know, we're seeing a parallel between Jesus and, um, you know, this certain thing. Whether that was, uh, you know, even like this, the Egypt, the Exodus, um, and now seeing, you know, God saving. Yeah, people through the Exodus, and now God saving people through Christ. Um, and so these uh, typologies, uh, they detect patterns and types of how God works in history. Um, and it's not a second meaning, but a fuller meaning. And we talked a bit of the fuller meaning in the census plan here, but um, yeah, it maybe is a, you know, a fuller meaning than the fuller meaning in that sense. That's made that really confusing. I apologize. Um, yeah, and so part of this is using creative uh, exegetical methods to discover additional valid meanings, but this may or may not be repeatable. Um, so the idea is that we can develop ways where we can, uh, you know, essentially, <coughs> you know, not create, but we can follow the same follow a pattern of creating, not creating, but understanding uh, uh, dis <laughs> how do I, what even is the word that I'm trying to say? Um, texts. Uh, I've got it in here somewhere. Where's ways we can defend? methods where we can create uh yeah we can understand the in the intention and defend it uh, and so that's what we need to do so 
moving on from that, those are the potential ways we can look at uh, different meanings. We're now looking at an author-centered uh, textual meaning. And this should really be our, our central goal in exegesis, um, that the text has one meaning that the author intended. Um, and all we have for study is the biblical text from which you know, we can discern the author's intended meaning. It's all we've been given, and so that is from which we find the clues uh, as we are looking. Uh, and God's intended meaning is conveyed throughout the text. Uh, and in interpreting the text, uh, we need to be using normal canons of exegesis. We can arrive at God's message for people. Um, and so we must investigate with curiosity, leaving no stone unturned. Uh, understand the big picture, see the details, and not draw our conclusions too quickly. And so question your conclusions. Um, so as I've said, you know, there are ways in which maybe we can find that there are multiple meanings or a fuller meaning uh, or a typology in the text, but it's not as simple as just finding that every single thing only has one meaning, uh, especially when we're reading the Old Testament, that, uh, you know, even if it did, if, if they only had one meaning, then perhaps <laughs> we wouldn't have the New Testament. You know, that New Testament wouldn't be valid in that sense. Um, but there are, uh, there are exceptions, there are challenges, things that we have to be aware and looking at. Um, but we cannot paint with a broad stroke the fact that, you know, you know, that every passage can have multiple meanings, like an allegory, um, or that the Holy Spirit will give us uh, an understanding of some embedded uh, second or fuller meaning of an Old Testament passage. Um, and so, you know, while there are things that, uh, that are in there, I think Possibly some of the rule of thumb is to rely on, you know, well, that only can exist if the New Testament authors wrote about it and saw it, and then we can make that jump uh, that they saw it in the, in the original text. So yeah, so that's that. Um, and then moving on to validating our interpretation. Um, again, this is uh, talking a little bit even again about what we talked about last week. Um, but, you know, we need to be asking, what does the text tell us about the author's intention? Um, and we need to be asking, what is our uh, personal biases, uh, biases as we're reading the text, uh, reading into that intention? Um, and so criteria for probable uh, interpretation. Uh, you know, is the interpretation likely... Uh, likely given uh, the text's original context. Um, so as, as we are interpreting it, are we taking into account the original context? Um, is our, does our interpretation account for all of the evidence that is being given? Are we just proof texting a certain verse? Are we looking at the entirety or the scope uh, of what is being given? Uh, or even, you know, in the broader sense, across the Bible. What is the bigger picture telling us about that interpretation? What is the other evidence being shown? Um, you know, it's the way we look at understanding systematic theologies, um, you know, where we're looking at maybe not something, a specific biblical piece of theology that we're taking out of the text, but, you know, when we're understanding our whole idea for the Lord's Supper, um, or we're just understanding God's holiness as, as an entirety, you know, there's a whole lot of other texts that speak to it. Um, what, what is the evidence? Uh, is it consistent with the conventions of its genre? Um, so we're going to be looking more into that, I believe, uh, starting next week or the week after, week after. So next week, we're going to be covering uh, general rules of hermeneutics. So we're going to be looking at a little bit more of the grammar, or the we're going to be looking at prose uh, and uh, biblical poetry. So 
just kind of looking at how do we understand uh, those general rules as we're looking at the actual grammar and the text itself. Um, but yeah, so we're looking at the convention, is it consistent with the conventions of its genre? Uh, so each type of book uh, has some specific rules that we'll be covering in a couple weeks of understanding uh, does that fit. So, and it must make sense. If your interpretation doesn't make sense, it's probably invalid. Um, uh, so that challenging uh, our personal bias, biases, um, we need to weigh all evidence pertaining to the text's most probable meaning and the interpreter's personal bias. Um, we have to account for prejudice, uh, narrow-mindedness, sin, depravity, social, sexual, racial, uh, political, economic, and religious factors. Um, we need to read and listen to others. So whether that's, uh, you know, people in our own church, for one, uh, looking back at, you know, what did the church, early church fathers say on certain things? Because um, there's uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, some help and, you um, knowledge to be gained by looking back on our early church tradition. It's maybe not as simple as just becoming what the early church was, but uh, also looking through the tradition of our church and looking through commentaries and uh, all of these things. So challenge uh, your personal biases through, through those things. We need to agree to disagree sometimes. Uh, you know, maybe church unity is of utmost importance. What do you guys, what do you think about the idea of agreeing to disagree? Um, I know that can be... I think that's very important. Yeah? Because uh, every one of us has a different view in certain things. We have to agree upon the, the first thing is Christ alone is our salvation. But uh, there's lots of other uh, things brought up that I might not agree with, you might not agree with me. So as a fellowship and body of Christ, we have to agree to not agree, disagree on certain things. But the most important things we have to agree upon or we got to yeah. look the other way. We have to leave or do something, you know, because we have to be in unity on the on the important things, the other things can be minor, and uh, we don't really need to dwell on them, you know. And uh, that's all I got to say. Any thoughts? Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree completely. <laughs> I agree to disagree, but yeah. <laughs> um, I think this is, you know, this can be the question. I think some some people struggle with this more than others. Of well, if you know, if Scripture is truth, you know, our theology also will need to be true, and. Therefore, if I'm convicted of, of something that is to be true and you don't agree with me, um, you know, there can be some, some pretty big, big struggles when we're talking about certain theological issues. Um, and, yeah, I was talking about last week, I was part of a, um, a class on intercultural uh theology and and so we had one of the it's a fellowship uh, missionary actually he's a doctor and um, he had shared with us uh, you know just the different ways that the world in different parts of the world will you know will explore different things theologically or see things theologically um, and practice you know even church uh, and and part of this whole thing for me was like I almost felt like my my faith or my theological structure that I've developed is like come crumbling down because you know the question is well 
what is truth or what is true when we're coming when we're talking about theology um and you know how do we how do i reconcile the fact that somebody else is you know maybe worshiping god in a different way than i am that i see well maybe i think that is wrong um but you know maybe my narrow-mindedness is is not or my context doesn't allow me to see things more fully um that's that's one thing I've learned over the years because I grew up in a Baptist background. The theology of, of the Baptists, and then we, my parents started this church here in 1948, and uh, under the Baptist background. But we came when we came to Quantic in '47. There was no church activity at all at all. And so within a year, my dad and a bunch of the men from the mission church built the building that was on the parking lot. That time. So anyways, to make a long story short, there was not an entire Baptist in the whole <laughs> community. There was United, there was Pentecostal, there was Lutheran, there was Mennonite Brethren. And so this church was formed under the independent. Right. And uh, we sort of carried on with the Baptist background and Baptist believing in our, our uh, constitution and everything, but we didn't dogmatic it. We basically uh, invite, welcome everybody in there into the, the congregation and we providing they were born again and baptized by, baptism by immersion, they were welcomed. And those other differences we just agree to disagree on or we come, as we're going along, people come around to what our police was. And that's what's happened since 1948. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I kind of know what you're talking about when it comes to having to, to adjust yourself to other people's views as you're going along and yeah. not be dogmatic about it. You know? it. It is something where, you know, like we've said, um, there are certain things that we find in Scripture that are not as clear as other things. Mm -hmm. And there's clarity, I believe, among the gospel and salvation. Um, and, baptism by immersion and stuff like that and, is all clear as a bell, but other things are. Yeah, and and there are things that we we can agree to, as we said, agree to disagree. Yep. Um, there was a a church that uh, I had attended a couple times, and it was involved with a, a camp that I was working at at the time, because um, it was a the closest community church uh, to us, um, and I. Through my time working at that camp, it this this little church ended up like it had such a focus on truth, like they were like very dogmatic about you know we we are we believe the truth and we our vision our ideas you know we have to make sure that we understand you know theological truth and they held it so tightly gripped. Um, you know, when, when we could, uh, at, at the time we couldn't, for the most part, we, we weren't able as staff to actually go to church on Sundays because most of our camps went over the weekend instead. Um, but when we could go to, go to church, they, I remember a couple, a leader or so had said, uh, to our camp director or asked him if, you know, why, why he didn't essentially mandate us as staff to go to their church on a Sunday, um, you know, because, and, and he had said, you know, because we know that some of your staff go to heretical churches. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, there's a pretty, there's a pretty broad swath of us and from different denominations working at this camp. Um, and I, I was a little offended to hear that, you know, 
that we're so broadly throwing out this word heretical at, at different churches that we're so tightly grasping, you know, the truth that we believe is the only truth. Um, and if you don't agree with us, then you're wrong or possibly even not a Christian. Um, and I was reading, listening to a podcast this week, and they're talking about, you know, what are the benefits of denominationalism or, you know, having denominations. And, you know, as much as, you know, sometimes we can look at maybe it being a bit of a disunity in the church, um, which it could be in a, in a way in that view, um, but it also allows us, you know, for the certain things that maybe we disagree on, uh, to find a, find a group where we do agree with. Um, where you don't have to, you know, where we, you wouldn't have to have so much disagreement having one church uh, just on these certain issues that you can find a group of a body of believers that you do agree with for the most part and, and can put yourself into and, you know, move forward in. Um, but even in our own denomination, there are things that we will disagree on. And, and yeah, and the sad thing about that church is they had, in the time that I had been there uh, working at that camp, uh, they had split from their main church, ended up in this tiny little town, had two meetings that they were doing, uh, and then even that super core uh, tight-fisted group that had split off ended up essentially splitting again or crumbled to nothing almost. And because church unity was not the goal. Uh, the truth was the goal. And, and as we've discussed, you know, even when we're looking at the text through our own uh, well, worldview. Every, every one of us looks at that text and we come up with a different idea yeah. of what it's saying. But it isn't the fact that we come up with a different idea that we're so dogmatic that everybody has to, to see our way yeah. We come up with a, a different idea because it's a different personality view of the text. And if we work together, we can all benefit by it. Or if we get so dogmatic, then nobody benefits. That's the way I see it. Yeah. My biggest takeaway from all of this has been humility. Is That's right. Whether we're, you know, whether the church, you know, in Africa is, is you know, they're having super excited four-hour-long services, and we're sitting here, we've got a, our 10-30-minute our, our 10, 10 to 30-minute sermon, and, you know, we're out in an hour. Um, who's to say who is right and who's wrong? Like, we do things a little bit differently, and, and we can't say that, well, the way that we do church is the right way. Um, well, you look at, uh, in the Bible, there's Paul spoke and Eutychus fell out the window because he fell yeah. asleep. <laughs> so that tells me it was a fair long sermon. <laughs> well, if, if, we join, if we join churches, Lyle, we're going to have to make sure you're not sitting by any windows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are used to Arnold's sermons. Brent's are a little bit longer, but... <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's church unity is important, and, and that comes with humility. Uh, and I think that is something that I have been learning is of utmost importance, is, is our humility when it comes to understanding the text and understanding the meaning is we need to maybe not be so confident that we've always got it together, that we've got the right idea. So I'm going to tell, a story, tell you a story. <laughs> I went... I moved from here up to Fort McNeil for five years. I was working for Western Forest Products. And when the first week I got up there, I went to the Fort McNeil Baptist Church. And he, the pastor started preaching at 11 o'clock. At, at 12.30, we were still being preached to. And so I was there for two Sundays. The third Sunday, I cornered the pastor after the, after the service and I said, have you ever looked at your congregation at 12 o'clock? He says, no, not really. I said, well, look next time because you've lost every one of them by 12. And what you're talking about goes right over their heads. They're not a beat head for them. Fumbling through the hymn book, 
or looking at their cell phone or falling asleep. And so he says, well, but my sermon, he says, I won't get, I said, well, I'll preach the rest of it next Sunday, you know. And so anyways, the following Sunday, 12 o'clock, he looks up, we're already there at five minutes after 12. <laughs> and uh, one of the congregation guys came to me and he said, did you talk to the pastor? I said, yeah, I told him what I thought of it. He says, I've been wanting to tell him for two years and I haven't been able to tell him. <laughs> I'm only there two weeks and I already told him what I think. <laughs> and I think it's a generational thing. Like, I think understanding how generations are changing. Like, for example, um, before cell phones, everyone had actually a bit of a longer attention span. Kind of yeah. thing, right? They can sit there. Now, as technology is developing, like a child can't even sit still anymore, right? They always have to be doing something. Um, and it's just how our society has developed over the times. Um, so part of that, the way we are looking at, you know, how we operate even, or how we see things theologically, can also develop just through our context. And, uh, and things may need to change because of the culture, the context, um, and yeah. See, a lot, of, a lot of pastors, I'm not going to anything, but a lot of pastors, <laughs> have, have a, they have their texts, they bring their texts through to the climax, in 20 minutes, or 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, but then they repeat themselves back over again, over again, over again. I've already heard this three times. I don't need to hear another one. You know, it, well, the repetition's it, clearly repetition. getting through you. <laughs> repetition, you know, and by that time, I'm sound asleep. <laughs> well, they say in sales, the first time you say something, the customer will only understand 30%. That's you right. have to repeat it four or five times for them to understand 80%. I don't believe it. <laughs> the first time a salesman talks to me, I, I draw a conclusion that first time. <laughs> he can talk to me a hundred times afterwards and my conclusion, conclusion and you're one of those easy customers then, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, they're much more the, than hard The difficult ones. And then I'll go home and meditate on them. <laughs> well, anyways. We'll agree to disagree, I guess. <laughs> um, further with that is we need, you know, as we said, we need to consult with other believers. Um, you know, here, as I said, here in North America, we need to look at, you know, how do our, how do other believers here in North America look at it, or just Canada? Sometimes maybe the states can be a little off the rockers, who knows? Um, but yeah, but we also need to look at the interpretations of other cultures as well. And so look at that around it. Um, like I said, don't be so narrow-minded. Uh, and then do our, do our interpretations work uh, in real life and in the church? Um, because if, if it doesn't work in our own personal lives uh, and in the church, then it's useless, right? It, so we need to be uh, again, trying to find the author's original intention for the text. And so, uh, creative interpretation of a text must meet uh, these four criteria, as I said in this book. Um, it conforms to orthodox Christian theology, uh, essentially what the traditions uh, has uh, shown us. Uh, also, uh, corresponds to a patterns of God's truth. Um, so we're looking at, you know, the Bible as a whole. Uh, it works in the crucible of the Christian experience, uh, produces godliness, uh, fruits of the Spirit, etc. And, you know, as it said again, it finds confirmation along the full spectrum uh, of Orthodox, both generally or traditionally accepted as right or true uh, as Christians. So, Yeah. So that is our goal. So what what is our goal of interpretation? Find the author's intended meaning. Author meaning God, not the like that's why we have multiple meanings. <laughs>
Yeah. So that is that. Well, any other questions or comments? Lyle's got comments. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask that to understand then, for example, Hebrews and everything like that, the text, you would need to understand, of course, what the authors say, uh, who the author is speaking to, but then also the timeline, I guess, as well. Right? To understand the year that he spoke, he or she spoke. Um, because that's the only way you're going to understand the context. Then, right? Like, for example, if you can talk about slavery, like how Paul spoke about slavery, well, the context back then, that slavery was kind of normal. Right? Yeah, did, um, did Paul write that in, uh, you know, <laughs> Civil War, of the, during the Civil War of the States? Exactly. Or well, did, yeah. did he write that, you know, what year did he write that? Yeah. What was the view? So back? understanding the history behind it all, you know, complete research needs to be done um, or at I least some very that, basic understandings yeah, basic, of, yeah. of what is and I think place. that's something that actually I, as I'm thinking about it like the church is in general we lack it quite a bit uh, we never like I never thought of it this way is that like in our Bible studies do we actually talk about like here and there we'll kind of like when we went through Timothy we kind of did a tiny bit of it yeah but um a lot of Bible studies don't do that at all, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, whether it's personal Bible study or just, you know, home groups or Bible study groups in the church, I think we struggle with it. As pastors, um, not all of us, but many of us do try our best, especially to, you know, to, to give that understanding uh, expositionally, you know, as we're going through a book. Um, to help, you know, understand everybody to understand the context, and maybe not everybody ends up taking that in because they probably don't listen to the preacher anyway. But well, the, um, <laughs> the um, I think all all texts, New Testament or Old Testament, they should be bringing them together. Mm -hmm. You know, because like Hebrews refers back to the Old Testament, Isaiah, and everything, and you can. You can relate them both together if you read them close. And uh, that pertains to everything. And sometimes you, you get preachers that preach nothing but except the New Testament and the Holy Spirit and everything. But the, the food and where everything started from is never mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's not the words I should use, but that's the way I think I see it. And, uh, but I personally believe that it does not hurt to be preached to on the Old Testament as much as the New Testament, because you, you read the Old Testament, and if you read it carefully and then read the New Testament and pertaining to that, it all ties together. That's and we have so much a tendency in this country, in this time frame, of just looking at the New Testament and the, and the second coming of the Lord, but we don't look back to what it comes down to that the New Testament happened. is more logical. In that's, people's mind, it's more logical. That's where in the Old Testament, like, there's people, Christians that I met that they're like, oh, no, in the ark, that never happened. It's just yeah, no. this, right? Or uh, <laughs> even like uh, Adam and Eve, like you and I talked about that time, creation versus um, evolution type of scenarios. Uh, well, that's that. where I draw my line. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's, it's something we have to... I think we really need to look at when, especially in our own personal study and our studies with others. Um, you know, Harvey, I, there's, I've got, I've got a Bible that kind of gives a little introductory page before each each book to at least give you some some understanding. Um, and and each book should, you know, as as you're reading through an introduction, uh, you should be also looking at how those stories fit as 
uh, as Lyle's saying, into you know the big picture of Scripture and how you know how God started His work with Adam and Eve. Uh, you know, continue that through Moses and the, through the Exodus and how you know how that is you know in the law and how why that's important and then how Jesus is now the culmination of all of that and has now you know made it available for everybody. So. Yep. I uh, like right now I'm reading the book of Job. <laughs> and there was a man that went through a lot of troubles. <laughs> and I always related myself to Job, but I don't think I had any trouble like he had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it is going to be important that you, you know, as we start looking at scriptures, asking the questions of uh, why was this written? What was the purpose of the author actually writing this book? Who was it supposed to be for? Um, and that will start to help us understand the the intended meaning in the text and uh, show us, you know maybe that there's some other uh yeah there's a a universal under or maybe underlying or overlying meaning that uh that is in the text and then what are the different ways that that can be applied well i think one of the things that Job in Job it tells us not to listen to our friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah not his friends that's for sure <laughs> Maybe maybe don't listen to some certain friends. But yeah. <laughs> be under yeah. Be careful of what your friends are saying. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Lyle, would you mind closing us in prayer? Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for the fellowship we had, Lord. We thank you for the uh, knowledge of what you've taught us tonight, Lord. And I pray that we would think upon it, meditate upon it, and apply it to our 